Chapter Five of Emily Bronte by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Going to school. Emily was now sixteen years old and though the people in the village called her the cleverest of the Bronte children, she had little to show of her cleverness. Her education was as home-made as her gowns, not such as would give distinction to a governess, and a governess Emily would have to be. The Bronte sisters were too severe and noble in their theories of life ever to contemplate marriage as a means of livelihood, but even worldly sisters would have owned that there was little chance of impatient Emily marrying at all. She was almost violent in her dislike of strangers. The first time that Ellen stayed at Haworth, Charlotte was ill one day and could not go out with her friend. To her surprise, Emily volunteered to take the stranger a walk over the moors. Charlotte waited anxiously for their return, fearing some outbreak of impatience or disdain on the part of her untamable sister, the two girls at last came home. How did Emily behave? asked Charlotte, eagerly drawing her friend aside. She had behaved well. She had shown her true self, her noble, energetic, truthful soul, and from that day there was a real friendship between the gentle Ellen and the intractable Emily. But none the less does Charlotte's question reveal in how different a manner the girl regarded strangers as a rule. In after days, when the curates, looking for Mr. Bronte in his study, occasionally found Emily there instead, they used to beat such a hasty retreat that it was quite an established joke at the parsonage that Emily appeared to the outer world in the likeness of an old bear. She hated strange faces and strange places. Her sisters must have seen that such a temperament if it made her unlikely to attract a husband, or to wish to attract one, also rendered her lamentably unfit to earn her living as a governess. In those days they could not tell that the defect was incurable, a congenital infirmity of nature, and doubtless Charlotte, the wise elder sister, thought she had found a cure for both the narrow education and the narrow sympathies when she suggested that Emily should go to school. She writes to her friend in July, 1835, I had hoped to have had the extreme pleasure of seeing you at Haworth this summer, but human affairs are mutable, and human resolutions must bend to the course of events. We are all about to divide, break up, separate. Emily is going to school. Branwell is going to London, and I am going to be a governess. This last determination I formed myself knowing I should have to take the step sometime, and better soon as signed to use a Scotch proverb, and knowing well that Papa would have enough to do with his limited income should Branwell be placed at the Royal Academy and Emily at Roe Head. Where am I going to reside, you will ask? within four miles of you, at a place neither of us are unacquainted with, being no other than the identical rowhead mentioned above. Yes, I am going to teach in the very school where I was myself taught. Miss Wooler made me the offer, and I preferred it to one or two proposals of private governessship which I had before received. I am sad, very sad, at the thoughts of leaving home, but duty, necessity, these are stern mistresses who will not be disobeyed. Did I not once say you ought to be thankful for your independence? I felt what I said at the time, and I repeat it now with double earnestness. If anything would cheer me, it is the idea of being so near you. Surely you and Polly will come and see me. It would be wrong in me to doubt it. You were never unkind yet. Emily and I leave home on the 27th of this month. The idea of being together consoles us both somewhat. And in truth, since I must enter a situation, 
my lines have fallen in pleasant places i both love and respect miss wooler footnote mrs gaskell End footnote. the wrench of leaving home so much dreaded by charlotte was yet sharper to her younger sister morbidly fearful of strangers eccentric unable to live without wide liberty to go to school it must have had a dreadful sound to that untamable free creature happiest alone with the dogs on the moors with little sentiment or instinct for friendship no desire to meet her fellows emily was perfectly happy at haworth cooking the dinner ironing the linen writing poems at the waterfall taking her dog for miles over the moors pacing round the parlour with her arm round gentle anne's waist now she would have to leave all this to separate from her dear little sister but she was reasonable and just and feeling the attempt should be made she packed up her scanty wardrobe and without repining set out with charlotte for roe head charlotte knew where she was going she loved and respected miss wooler but with what anxiety must emily have looked for the house where she was to live and not to be at home at last she saw it a cheerful roomy country house standing a little apart in a field there was a wide and pleasant view of fields and woods but the green prospect was sullied and marred by the smoke from the frequent mills green fields gray mills all told of industry labor and occupation there was no wild stretch of moorland here no possibility of solitude i think when emily bronte saw the place she must have known very well she would not be happy there my sister emily loved the moors says charlotte writing of these days in the latter solitude flowers brighter than the rose bloomed in the blackest of the heath for her out of a sullen hollow in a livid hillside her mind could make an eden she found in the bleak solitude many and dear delights and not the least and best loved was liberty liberty was the breath of emily's nostrils without it she perished the change from her own home to a school and from her own very noiseless very secluded but unrestricted and unartificial mode of life to one of disciplined routine though under the kindest auspices was what she failed in enduring her nature was here too strong for her fortitude every morning when she woke the visions of home and the moors rushed on her and darkened and saddened the day that lay before her nobody knew what ailed her but me i knew only too well in this struggle her health was quickly broken her white face attenuated form and failing strength threatened rapid decline i felt in my heart she would die if she did not go home thus looking on charlotte grew alarmed she remembered the death of maria and elizabeth and feared feared with anguish lest this best beloved sister should follow them she told miss wooler of her fear and the schoolmistress conscious of her own kindness and a little resentful at emily's distress consented that the girl should be sent home without delay she did not care for emily and was not sorry to lose her so in october she returned to haworth to the only place where she was happy and well she returned to harder work and plainer living than she had known at school but also to home liberty comprehension her animals and her flowers in her native atmosphere she very soon recovered the health and strength that seemed so natural to her swift spirit that were alas so easily endangered she had only been at school three months even so short an absence may very grievously alter the aspect of familiar things haworth itself was the same prim tidy miss branwell still pattered about in her huge caps and tiny clogs the vicar still told his horrible stories at breakfast 
still fought vain battles with the parishioners who would not drain the village and the women who would dry their linen on the tombstones anne was still as transparently pretty as pensive and pious as of old but over the hope of the house the dashing clever branwell who was to make the name of bronte famous in art a dim tarnishing change had come emily must have seen it with fresh eyes left more and more in branwell's company when after the christmas holidays anne returned with charlotte to roe head there is in none of charlotte's letters any further talk of sending branwell to the royal academy he earnestly desired to go and for him the only son any sacrifice had willingly been made but there were reasons why that brilliant unprincipled lad should not be trusted now alone in london too frequent had been those visits to the black bull undertaken at first to amuse the travellers from london leeds and manchester who found their evenings dull the vicar's lad was following the proverbial fate of parsons sons little as they foreboded the end in store greatly as they hoped all his errors were a mere necessary attribute of manliness the sisters must have read in his shaken nerves the dissipation for which their clever branwell was already remarkable in haworth it is true that to be sometimes the worse for drink was no uncommon fault fifty years ago in yorkshire but the gradual coarsening of branwell's nature the growing flippancy the altered health must have been a cruel awakening to his sister's dreams for his career in eighteen thirty six this deterioration was at the beginning a weed in bud that could only bear a bitter and poisonous fruit emily hoped the best his father did not seem to see his danger miss branwell spoiled the lad and the village thought him a mighty pleasant young gentleman with a smile and a bow for every one fond of a glass and a chat in the pleasant parlour of the black bull at nights a gay feckless red-haired smiling young fellow full of ready courtesies to all his friends in the village yet none the less as full of thoughtless cruelties to his friends at home for the rest he had nothing to do and was scarcely to blame if he could not devote sixteen hours a day to writing verses for the leeds mercury his only ostensible occupation it seems incredible that mr bronte who well understood the peculiar temptations to which his son lay open could have suffered him to loaf about the village doing nothing month after month lured into ill by no set purpose but by a weak social temper and foolish friends yet so it was and with such training little hope of salvation could there be for that vain somewhat clever untruthful fascinating boy so things went on drearily enough in reality though perhaps more pleasantly in seeming for branwell with his love of approbation and ready affectionateness took all trouble consistent with self-indulgence to avoid the noise of his misdemeanours reaching home thus things went on till charlotte returned from miss wooler's with little anne in the midsummer holidays of eighteen thirty six an interval of happiness to lonely emily charlotte's friend came to the grey cold-looking parsonage enlivening that sombre place with her gay youth and sweet looks home with four young girls in it was more attractive to branwell than the alluring parlour of the black bull the harvest moon that year can have looked on no happier meeting it would not be right says the survivor of those eager spirits to pass over one record which should be made of the sisters lives together after their school days and before they were broken in health by their efforts to support themselves that at this time they had all a taste of happiness and enjoyment they were beginning to feel conscious of their powers they were rich in each other's companionship their health was good their spirits were high there was often joyousness and mirth they commented on what they read analyzed articles and their writers also 
the perfection of unrestrained talk and intelligence brightened the close of the days which were passing all too swiftly the evening march in the sitting-room a constant habit learned at school kept time with their thoughts and feelings it was free and rapid they marched in pairs emily and anne charlotte and her friend with arms twined round each other in childlike fashion except when charlotte in an exuberance of spirit would for a moment start away making a graceful pirouette though she had never learned to dance and return to her march so the evenings passed and the days in happy fashion for a little while then charlotte and anne went back to miss wooler's and emily too took up the gauntlet against necessity she was not of a character to let the distastefulness of any duty hinder her from undertaking it she was very stern in her dealings with herself though tender to the erring and anxious to bear the burdens of the weak she allowed no one but herself to decide what it behooved her to do she could not see charlotte labor and not work herself at home she worked it is true harder than servants but she felt it right not only to work but to earn so having recovered her natural strength she left haworth in september and charlotte writes from school to her friend my sister emily has gone into a situation as teacher in a large school near halifax i have had one letter from her since her departure it gives an appalling account of her duties hard labor from six in the morning to eleven at night with only one half hour of exercise between this is slavery i fear she can never stand it she stood it however all that term came back to haworth for a brief rest at christmas and again left it for the hated life she led drudging among strangers but when spring came back with its feverish weakness with its beauty and memories to that stern place of exile she failed her health broke down shattered by long resisted homesickness weary and mortified at heart emily again went back to seek life and happiness on the wild moors of haworth End of chapter five chapter six of emily bronte by agnes mary frances robinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami girlhood at haworth the next two years passed very solitarily for emily at haworth the brontes were too poor for all to stay at home and since it was definitely settled that emily could not live away she worked hard at home while her sisters went out in the world to gain their bread she had no friend besides her sisters far-off anne was her only confidant outside her own circle the only person that she cared to meet was charlotte's friend ellen and of course ellen did not come to haworth while charlotte was away branwell too was absent his first engagement was as usher in a school but mortified by the boy's sarcasms on his red hair and downcast smallness he speedily threw up his situation and returned to haworth to confide his wounded vanity to the tender mercies of the rough and valiant emily or to loaf about the village seeking readier consolation then he went as a private tutor to a family in broughton and furness one letter of his dispatched to some congenial spirit in haworth long since dead has been lent to me by the courtesy of mr william wood one of the last of branwell's companions in whose possession the torn faded sheet remains much of it is unreadable from accidental rents and the purposed excision of private passages and part of that which can be read cannot be quoted such as it is the letter is valuable as showing what things in life seemed desirable and worthy of attainment to this much hoped in brother of the austere emily and the courageous charlotte the pious anne broughton in furness march fifteenth old knave of trumps don't think i have forgotten you though i have delayed so long in writing to you it was my purpose to send you a yarn as soon as i could find materials to spin one with 
and it is only just now I have had time to turn myself round and know where I am. If you saw me now, you would not know me, and you would laugh to hear the character the people give me. Oh, the falsehood and hypocrisy of this world! I am fixed in a little town retired by the seashore, embowered in woody hills that rise round me, huge, rocky, and capped with clouds. My employer is a retired county magistrate and large landowner of a right hearty, generous disposition. His wife is a quiet, silent, amiable woman. His sons are two fine-spirited lads. My landlord is a respectable surgeon and six days out of seven is drunk as a lord. His wife is a bustling, chattering, kind-hearted soul. His daughter, oh, death and damnation. Well, what am I? That is, what do they think I am? A most sober, abstemious, patient, mild-hearted, virtuous, gentlemanly philosopher, the picture of good works, the treasure-house of righteous thought. Cards are shuffled under the tablecloth, glasses are thrust into the cupboard if I enter the room. I take neither spirit, wine, nor malt liquors. I dress in black and smile like a saint or martyr. Every lady says, what a good young gentleman is the Postlewaite's tutor. This, in fact, as I am a living soul, and right comfortably do I laugh at them, but in this humor do I mean them to continue. I took a half-year's farewell of old friend Whiskey at Kendall the night after I left. There was a party of gentlemen at the Royal Hotel. I joined them and ordered in supper and toddy as hot as hell. They thought I was a physician and put me into the chair. I gave them some toasts of the stiffest sort, washing them down at the same time till the room spun round and the candles danced in their eyes. One was a respectable old gentleman, with a powdered head, rosy cheeks, fat paunch, and ringed fingers. He let off with a speech, and in two minutes, in the very middle of a grand sentence, stopped, wagged his head, looked wildly round, stammered, coughed, stopped again, called for his slippers, and so the waiter helped him to his bed. Next, a tall Irish squire and a native of the land of Israel began to quarrel about their countries, and in the warmth of argument discharged their glasses each at his neighbor's throat instead of his own. I recommended blisters, bleeding, here illegible, so I flung my tumbler on the floor too and swore I'd join old Ireland. A regular rumpus ensued, but we were tamed at last, and I found myself in bed next morning with a bottle of porter, a glass, and a corkscrew beside me. Since then I have not tasted anything stronger than milk and water, nor I hope shall I till I return at midsummer, when we will see about it. I am getting as fat as Prince Wynne at Springhead, and as godly as his friend Parson Winterbottom. My hand shakes no longer. I write to the bankers at Ulverston, with Mr. Postlewaite, and sit drinking tea and talking slander with old ladies. As to the young ones, I have one sitting by me just now, fair-faced, blue-eyed, dark-haired, sweet eighteen. She little thinks the devil is as near her. I was delighted to see thy note, old squire, but don't understand one sentence. Perhaps you will know what I mean. You tell me, likewise, about your keeping two hens and a cock, as if I did not know you kept a cock long since, and a game cock too by Jupiter. How are all about you? I long, all torn next, everything about Haworth folk. Does little Nosy think I have forgotten him? No, by Jupiter. Nor is Alec either. I'll send him a remembrance one of these days. But I must talk to someone prettier. So good night, old boy. Write directly, and believe me to be thine, the philosopher. Branwell's boasted reformation was not kept up for long. Soon he came back as heartless, as affectionate, as vain, as unprincipled as ever, to laugh and loiter about the steep street of Haworth. Then he went to Bradford as a portrait painter, and so impressive his audacity, actually succeeded for some months in gaining a living there, although his education was of the slenderest, and judging from the specimens still treasured in Haworth, his natural talent on a level with that of the average new student in any school of art. His tawny mane, his pose of untaught genius, his verses in the poet's corner of the paper, could not forever keep afloat 
this untaught and thriftless portrait painter of twenty. Soon there came an end to his painting there. He disappeared from Bradford suddenly, heavily in debt, and was lost to sight, until, unnerved, a drunkard and an opium-eater, he came back to home and Emily at Haworth. Meanwhile, impetuous Charlotte was growing nervous and weak, gentle Anne consumptive and dejected, in their work away from home, and Emily was toiling from dawn till dusk with her old servant Tabby, for the old aunt who never cared for her, and the old father always courteous and distant. They knew the face of necessity more nearly than any friends, those Bronte girls, and the pinch of poverty was for their own foot. Therefore were they always considerate to any that fell into the same plight. During the Christmas holidays of 1837, old Tabby fell on the steep and slippery street and broke her leg. She was already nearly seventy and could do little work. Now her accident laid her completely aside, leaving Emily, Charlotte, and Anne to spend their Christmas holidays in doing the housework and nursing the invalid. Miss Branwell, anxious to spare the girl's hands and her brother-in-law's pocket, insisted that Tabby should be sent to her sister's house to be nursed and another servant engaged for the parsonage. Tabby, she represented, was fairly well off, her sister in comfortable circumstances. The parsonage kitchen might supply her with broths and jellies in plenty, but why waste the girl's leisure and scanty patrimony on an old servant competent to keep herself? Mr. Bronte was finally persuaded and his decision made known. But the girls were not persuaded. Tabby, so they averred, was one of the family, and they refused to abandon her in sickness. They did not say much, but they did more than say. They starved. When the tea was served, the three sat silent, fasting. Next morning found their will yet stronger than their hunger. No breakfast. They did the day's work and dinner came. Still they held out, wan and sunk. Then the superiors gave in. The girls gained their victory, no stubborn freak but the right to make a generous sacrifice and to bear an honorable burden. That Christmas, of course, there could be no visiting nor the next. Tabby was slow in getting well, but she did not outweary the patience of her friends. Two years later, Charlotte writes to her old schoolfellow, December 21st, 1839. We are at present and have been during the last month rather busy, as for that space of time we have been without a servant except the little girl to run errands. Poor Tabby became so lame that she was at length obliged to leave us. She is residing with her sister in a little house of her own, which she bought with her own savings a year or two since. She is very comfortable and wants nothing. As she is near, we see her very often. In the meantime, Emily and I are sufficiently busy, as you may suppose. I manage the ironing and keep the rooms clean. Emily does the baking and attends to the kitchen. We are such odd animals that we prefer this mode of contrivance to having a new face among us. Besides, we do not despair of Tabby's return, and she shall not be supplanted by a stranger in her absence. I excited Aunt's wrath very much by burning the clothes the first time I attempted to iron, but I do better now. Human feelings are queer things. I am much happier blackletting the stoves, making the beds and sweeping the floors at home than I should be living like a fine lady anywhere else. The year 1840 found Emily Branwell and Charlotte all at home together. Unnerved and dissipated as he was, Branwell was still a welcome presence. His gay talk still awakened glad promises in the ambitious and loving household which hoped all things from him. His mistakes and faults they pardoned, thinking, poor souls, that the strong passions which led him astray betokened a strong character and not a powerless will. It was still to Branwell that they looked for the fame of the family. Their poems, their stories, were to these girls but a legitimate means of amusement and relief. The serious business of their life was to teach, to cook, to clean, to earn or save the mere expense of their existence. 
no dream of literary fame gave a purpose to the quiet days of emily bronte charlotte and branwell more impulsive more ambitious had sent their work to southey to coleridge to wordsworth in vain pathetic hope of encouragement or recognition not so the sterner emily to whom expression was at once a necessity and a regret emily's brain emily's locked desk these and nothing else knew the degree of her passion her genius her power and yet acknowledged power would have been sweet to that dominant spirit meanwhile the immediate difficulty was to earn a living even those patient and courageous girls could not accept the thought of a whole lifetime spent in dreary governessing by charlotte and anne in solitary drudgery by housekeeping emily one way out of this hateful vista seemed not impossible of attainment for years it was the wildest hope the cherished dream of the author of wuthering heights and the author of villette and what was this dear and daring ambition to keep a lady school at haworth far enough off difficult to reach it looked to them this paltry commonplace ideal of theirs for the house with its four bedrooms would have to be enlarged for the girl's education with its anglo-french and stumbling music would have to be adorned by the requisite accomplishments this would take time time and money two luxuries most hard to get for the vicar of haworth's harassed daughters they would sigh and suddenly stop in their making of plans and drawing up of circulars it seemed so difficult one person indeed might help them miss branwell had saved out of her annuity of fifty pounds a year she had a certain sum small enough but to charlotte and emily it seemed as potent as the fairy's wand the question was would she risk it it seemed not the old lady had always chiefly meant her savings for the dear prodigal who bore her name and emily and charlotte were not her favourites the girls indeed only asked for a loan but she doubted hesitated doubted again they were too proud to take an advantage so grudgingly proffered and while their talk was still of what means they might employ while they still painfully toiled through improper french novels as the best substitute for french conversation they gave up the dream for the present and charlotte again looked out for a situation nearly a year elapsed before she found it a happy year full of plans and talks with emily and free from any more pressing anxiety than anne's delicate health always gave her sisters branwell was away and doing well as station-master at ludden den foot set off to seek his fortune in the wild wandering adventurous romantic knight-errant like capacity of clerk on the leeds and manchester railway ellen came to stay at haworth in the summer it was quite sociable and lively now in the grey house on the moors for compelled by failing health mr bronte had engaged the help of a curate and the haworth curate brought his clerical friends about the house to the great disgust of emily and the half sentimental fluttering of pensive anne which laid on charlotte the responsibility of talking for all three in the holidays when anne was at home all the old glee and enjoyment of life returned there was moreover the curate bonny pleasant light-hearted good-tempered generous careless crafty fickle and unclerical to add piquancy to the situation he sits opposite to anne at church sighing softly and looking out of the corners of his eyes and she is so quiet her look so downcast they are a picture says mary charlotte this first curate at haworth was exempted from emily's liberal scorn he was a favourite at the vicarage a clever bright-spirited and handsome youth greatly in miss branwell's good graces he would tease and flatter the old lady with such graciousness as made him ever sure of a welcome so that his daily visits to mr bronte's study were nearly always followed up by a call in the opposite parlour when miss branwell would frequently leave her upstairs retreat and join in the lively chatter she always presided at the tea-table at which the curate was a frequent guest and her two nieces would be kept well amused all through the tea-hour by the curate's piquant sallies baffling the old lady in her little schemes of control over the three high-spirited girls 
none enjoyed the fun more than quiet emily always present and amused her countenance glimmering as it always did when she enjoyed herself miss ellen nussey tells me many happy legends too familiar to be quoted here record the light-heart and gay spirit that emily bore in those untroubled days foolish pretty little stories of her dauntless protection of the other girls from two pressing suitors never was duenna so gallant so gay and so inevitable in compliment to the excellence of her swashing and martial outside on such occasions the little household dubbed her the major a name that stuck to her in days when the dash and gaiety of her soldiery bearing was sadly sobered down and only the courage and dauntless heart remained but in these early days of eighteen forty one emily was as happy as other healthy country girls in a congenial home she did what we did says miss nussey and never absented herself when she could avoid it life at this period must have been sweet and pleasant to her an equal uncheckered life in which trifles seemed of great importance we hear of the little joys and adventures of those days so faithfully and long remembered with a pathetic pleasurableness so slight they are and all their colour gone like pressed roses though a faint sweetness yet remains the disasters when miss branwell was cross and in no humour to receive her guests the long-expected excitement of a walk over the moors to keithley where the curate was to give a lecture the alarm and flurry when the curate finding none of the four girls had ever received a valentine proposed to send one to each on the next valentine's day no no the elders would never allow it and yet it would certainly be an event to receive a valentine still there would be such a lecture from miss branwell oh no he said i shall post them at bradford and to bradford he walked ten miles and back again so that on the eventful fourteenth of february the anxiously expected postman brought four valentines all on delicately tinted paper all enhanced by a verse of original poetry touching on some pleasant characteristic in each recipient what merriment and comparing of notes what pleased feigning of indignation the girls determined to reward him with a roland for his oliver and charlotte wrote some rhymes full of fun and raillery which all the girls signed emily entering into all this with much spirit and amusement and finally dispatched in mystery and secret glee at last this pleasant fooling came to an end charlotte advertised for a place and found it while she was away she had a letter from miss wooler offering charlotte the good will of her school at dewsbury moor it was a chance not to be lost although what inducement emily and charlotte could offer to their pupils it is not easy to imagine but it was above all things necessary to make a home where delicate anne might be sheltered where homesick emily could be happy where charlotte could have time to write where all might live and work together miss wooler's offer was immediately accepted miss branwell was induced to lend the girls one hundred pounds no answer came from miss wooler then ambitious charlotte from her situation away wrote to miss branwell at haworth september twenty ninth eighteen forty one dear aunt i have heard nothing of miss wooler yet since i wrote to her intimating that i would accept her offer i cannot conjecture the reason of this long silence unless some unforeseen impediment has occurred in concluding the bargain meantime a plan has been suggested and approved by mr and mrs blank and others which i wish now to impart to you my friends recommend if i desire to secure permanent success to delay commencing the school for six months longer and by all means to contrive by hook or by crook to spend the intervening time in some school on the continent they say schools in england are so numerous competition so great that without some such step toward attaining superiority we shall probably have a very hard struggle and may fail in the end they say moreover that the loan of one hundred pounds which you have been so kind as to offer us will perhaps not be all required now as miss wooler will lend us the furniture and that if the speculation is intended to be a good and a successful one half the sum at least ought to be laid out in the manner i have mentioned thereby ensuring a more speedy repayment both of interest and principal 
i would not go to france or to paris i would go to brussels in belgium the cost of the journey there at the present rate of travelling would be five pounds living is there little more than half as dear as it is in england and the facilities for education are equal or superior to any place in europe in half a year i could acquire a thorough familiarity with french i could improve greatly in italian and even get a dash at german that is provided my health continued as good as it is now these are advantages which would turn to real account when we actually commenced the school and if emily could share them with me we could take a footing in the world afterwards which we never can do now i say emily instead of anne for anne might take her turn at some future period if our school answered i feel certain while i am writing that you will see the propriety of what i say you always like to use your money to the best advantage you are not fond of making shabby purchases when you do confer a favour it is often done in style and depend upon it fifty pounds or a hundred pounds thus laid out would be well employed of course i know no other friend in the world to whom i could apply on this subject besides yourself i feel an absolute conviction that if this advantage were allowed us it would be the making of us for life papa will perhaps think it a wild and ambitious scheme but who ever rose in the world without ambition when he left ireland to go to cambridge university he was as ambitious as i am now that was true it must have struck a vibrant chord in the old man's breast absorbed in parish gossip and his cottage poems caring no longer for the world but only for newspaper reports of it actively idle living a resultless life of ascetic self-indulgence the vicar of haworth was very proud of his energetic past he had always held it up to his children as a model for them to copy charlotte's appeal would certainly secure her father as an ally to her cause miss branwell on the other hand would not wish for displays of ambition in her already too irrepressible nieces but she was getting old it would be a comfort to her after all to see them settled and prosperously settled through her generosity i look to you aunt to help us i think you will not refuse charlotte had said how indeed could miss branwell living in their home be happy and refuse yet many discussions went on before anxious charlotte got the answer emily whom it concerned as nearly must have listened waiting in a strange perturbation of hope and fear to leave home she knew well what it meant since she was six years old she had never left yorkshire but those months of wearying homesickness at rowhead and halifax must have most painfully rushed back upon her memory haworth was health content the very possibility of existence to this girl to leave haworth for a strange town beyond the seas to see strange faces all around to hear and speak a strange language charlotte's welcome prospect of adventure must have taken a nightmare shape to emily and for this she must hope this she must desire plead for if necessary and at least uphold for charlotte said the thing was essential to their future and in all details of management charlotte's word was law to her sisters even emily the independent indomitable emily so resolute in keeping to any chosen path looked to charlotte to choose the way in practical affairs at length consent was secured written and dispatched gleeful charlotte gave notice to her employers and soon set out for home there was much to be done letters to write to brussels to lille and to london lots of work to be done besides clothes to repair it was decided that the sisters should give up their chance of the school at dewsbury manor since the site was low and damp and had not suited anne on their return from brussels they were to set up a school in some healthy seaside place in the east riding burlington was the place where their fancy chiefly dwelt to this beautiful and healthy spot fronting the sea eager pupils would flock for the benefit of instruction by three daughters of a clergyman educated abroad for six months speaking thorough french improved italian and a dash of german a scintillating programme of accomplishment danced before their eyes 
there were however many practical difficulties to be vanquished first the very initial step the choice of a school was hard to take charlotte writes to ellen january twentieth eighteen forty two we expect to leave england in about three weeks but we are not yet certain as to the day as it will depend on the convenience of a french lady now in london madame martial under whose escort we are to sail our place of destination is changed papa received an unfavourable account from mr or rather from mrs jenkins of the french schools in bruxelles representing them as of an inferior caste in many respects on further inquiry an institution at lille in the north of france was highly recommended by baptiste noel and other clergymen and to that place it is decided that we are to go the terms are fifty pounds a year for each pupil for board and french alone but a separate room will be allowed for this sum without this indulgence they are something lower i considered it kind in aunt to consent to an extra sum for a separate room we shall find it a great privilege in many ways i regret the change from bruxelles to lille on many accounts for charlotte to regret the change was for an improvement to be discovered she had set her heart on going to brussels mrs jenkins redoubled her efforts and at length discovered the pensionnat of madame Eger in the rue d'isabelle thither as all the world is aware charlotte and emily bronte both of age went to school we shall leave england in about three weeks the words had a ring of happy daring in charlotte's ears since at six years of age she had set out alone to discover the golden city romance discovery adventure were sweet promises to her she had often wished to see the world now she will see it she had thirsted for knowledge here is the source she longed to add new notes to that gamut of human character which she could play with so profound a science she shall make a masterpiece out of her acquisitions at this time her letters are full of busy gaiety giving accounts of her work making plans making fun as happy and hopeful a young woman as any that dwells in haworth parish emily is different it is she who imagined the girl in heaven who broke her heart with weeping for earth till the angels cast her out in anger and flung her into the middle of the heath to wake there sobbing for joy she did not care to know fresh people she hates strangers to walk with her bulldog keeper over the moors is her best adventure to learn new things is very well but she prizes above everything originality and the wild provincial flavour of her home what she strongly deeply loves is her moorland home her own people the creatures on the heath the dogs who always feed from her hands the flowers in the bleak garden that only grow at all because of the infinite care she lavishes upon them the stunted thorn under which she sits to write her poems is more beautiful to her than the cedars of lebanon to each and all of these she must now bid farewell it is in a different tone that she says in her adieus we shall leave england in about three weeks End of chapter six Chapter Seven of Emily Bronte by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. In the Rue d'Isabelle. The Rue d'Isabelle had a character of its own. It lies below your feet as you stand in the Rue Royale near the statue of General Belliard. Four flights of stairs lead down to the street half garden half old houses with at one end a large square mansion owning the garden that runs behind it and to the right of it the house is old a latin inscription shows it to have been given to the great guild of crossbowmen by queen isabel in the early years of the seventeenth century the garden is older long before the guild of the crossbowmen of the great oath in deference to the wish of queen isabel permitted the street to be made through it the garden had been their exercising place there isabel herself a member of their order had shot down the bird but the garden had a yet more ancient past when apple-trees pear-trees and alleys of bruges cherries 
when plots of marjoram and mint of thyme and sweet basil filled the orchard and herbery of the hospital of the poor and the garden itself before trees or flowers were planted had resounded with the yelp of the duke's hounds when in the thirteenth century it had been the fosse aux chiens this historic garden this mansion built by a queen for a great order belonged in eighteen forty two to monsieur and madame Heger, and was a famous pensionnat de demoiselles there the vicar of haworth brought his two daughters one february day spent one night in brussels and went straight back to his old house on the moors so modern in comparison with the mansion in the rue d'isabelle a change indeed for emily and charlotte even now brussels the headquarters of catholicism far more than modern rome has a taste for pageantry that recalls medieval days the streets decked with boughs and strewn with flowers through which pass slowly the processions of the church white-clad children boys like angels scattering roses standard-bearers with emblazoned banners surpliced choristers singing latin praises acolytes in scarlet swinging censors reliquaries and images before which the people fall down in prayer all this to-day is no uncommon sight in brussels and must have been yet more frequent in eighteen forty two the flower market out of doors with clove pinks tall mary lilies and delicate rose d'amour filling the quaint medieval square before the beautiful old facade of the hotel de ville st gudule with its spires and arches the montagne de la cour almost as steep as haworth street its windows ablaze at night with jewels the little lovely park its great elms just coming into leaf its statues just bursting from their winter sheaths of straw the galleries of ancient pictures their walls a sober glory of colours blues deep as a summer night rich reds brown golds most vivid greens all this should have made an impression on the two home-keeping girls from yorkshire and charlotte indeed perceived something of its beauty and strangeness but emily from a bitter sense of exile from a natural narrowness of spirit rebelled against it all as an insult to the memory of her home she longed hopelessly uselessly for haworth the two brontes were very different to the belgian schoolgirls in madame heger's pensionnat they were for one thing ridiculously old to be at school twenty-four and twenty-six and they seemed to feel their position their speech was strained and odd all the sceptical wicked immoral french novels over forty of them the best substitute for french conversation to be met with which the girls had toiled through with so much singleness of spirit had not cured the broadness of their accent nor the artificial idioms of their yorkshire french m reger indeed considered that they knew no french at all their manners even among english people were stiff and prim the hardy vulgar genial expansion of their belgian schoolfellows must have made them seem as lifeless as marionettes their dress haworth had permitted itself to wonder at the uncouthness of those amazing leg of mutton sleeves emily's pet whim in and out of fashion at the ill-cut lankness of those skirts clumsy enough on round little charlotte but a very caricature of medievalism on emily's tall thin slender figure they knew they were not in their element and kept close together rarely speaking yet m reger patiently watching felt the presence of a strange power under those uncouth exteriors an odd little man of much penetration this french schoolmaster homme de zèle et de conscience il possède à un haut degré l'éloquence du bon sens et du coeur fierce and despotic in the exaction of obedience yet tender of heart magnanimous and tyrannical absurdly vain and absolutely unselfish his wife's school was a kingdom to him he brought to it an energy a zeal a faculty of administration worthy to rule a kingdom it was with the delight of a botanist discovering a rare plant in his garden 
of a politician detecting a future statesman in his nursery that he perceived the unusual faculty which lifted his two english pupils above their schoolfellows he watched them silently for some weeks when he had made quite sure he came forward and so to speak claimed them for his own charlotte at once accepted the yoke all that he set her to do she toiled to accomplish she followed out his trains of thought she adopted the style he recommended she gave him in return for all his pains the most unflagging obedience the affectionate comprehension of a large intelligence she writes to ellen of her delight in learning and serving it is very natural to me to submit very unnatural to command not so with emily the qualities which her sister understood and accepted irritated her unspeakably the masterfulness in little things the irritability the watchfulness of the fiery little professor of rhetoric were utterly distasteful to her she contradicted his theories to his face she did her lessons well but as she chose to do them she was as indomitable fierce and unappeasable as charlotte was ready and submissive and yet it was emily who had the larger share of monsieur heger's admiration egotistic and exacting he thought her who never yielded to his petulant harmless egoism who never gave way to his benevolent tyranny but he gave her credit for logical powers for a capacity for argument unusual in a man and rare indeed in a woman she not charlotte was the genius in his eyes although he complained that her stubborn will rendered her deaf to all reason when her own determination or her own sense of right was concerned he fancied she might be a great historian so he told mrs gaskell her faculty of imagination was such her views of scenes and characters would have been so vivid and so powerfully expressed and supported by such a show of argument that it would have dominated over the reader whatever might have been his previous opinions or his cooler perception of the truth she might have been a man a great navigator cried the little dark enthusiastic rhetorician her powerful reason would have deduced new spheres of discovery from the knowledge of the old and her strong imperious will would never have been daunted by opposition or difficulty never have given way but with life yet they were never friends though monsieur heger could speak so well of emily at a time be it remembered when it was charlotte's praises that were sought when emily's genius was set down as a lunatic's hobgoblin of nightmare potency he and she were alike too imperious too independent too stubborn a couple of swords neither of which could serve to sheathe the other that time in brussels was wasted upon emily the trivial characters which charlotte made immortal merely annoyed her the new impressions which gave another scope to charlotte's vision were nothing to her all that was grand remarkable passionate under the surface of that conventional pensionnat de demoiselle was invisible to emily notwithstanding her genius she was very hard and narrow poor girl she was sick for home it was all nothing to her less than a dream this place she lived in charlotte's engrossment in her new life her eagerness to please her master was a contemptible weakness to this embittered heart she would laugh when she found her elder sister trying to arrange her homely gowns in the french taste and stalk silently through the large schoolrooms with a fierce satisfaction in her own ugly sleeves in the haworth cut of her skirts she seldom spoke a word to any one only sometimes she would argue with monsieur heger perhaps secretly glad to have the chance of shocking charlotte if they went out to tea she would sit still on her chair answering yes and no inert miserable with a heart full of tears when her work was done she would walk in the cross bowman's ancient garden under the trees leaning on her shorter sister's arm pale silent a tall stooping figure often she said nothing at all 
charlotte also was very profitably speechless under her eyes villette was taking shape but emily did not think of brussels she was dreaming of haworth one poem that she wrote at this time may appropriately be quoted here it was charlotte tells us composed at twilight in the schoolroom when the leisure of the evening play hour brought back in full tide the thoughts of home a little while a little while the weary task is put away and i can sing and i can smile alike while i have holiday where wilt thou go my harassed heart what thought what scene invites thee now what spot or near or far apart has rest for thee my weary brow there is a spot mid barren hills where winter howls and driving rain but if the dreary tempest chills there is a light that warms again the house is old the trees are bare moonless above bends twilight's dome but what on earth is half so dear so longed for as the hearth of home the mute bird sitting on the stone the dark moss dripping from the wall the thorn tree gaunt the walks o'ergrown i love them how i love them all and as i mused the naked room the alien firelight died away and from the midst of cheerless gloom i passed to bright unclouded day a little and a lone green lane that opened on a common wide a distant dreary dim blue chain of mountains circling every side a heaven so dear and earth so calm so sweet so soft so hushed in air and deepening still the dreamlike charm wild moor sheep feeding everywhere that was the scene i knew it well i knew the turfy pathways sweep that winding o'er each billowing swell marked out the tracks of wandering sheep could i have lingered but an hour it well had paid a week of toil but truth has banished fancy's power restraint and heavy task recoil even as i stood with raptured eye absorbed in bliss so deep and dear my hour of rest had fleeted by and back came labor bondage care charlotte meanwhile writes in good even in high spirits to her friend i think i am never unhappy my present life is so delightful so congenial compared to that of a governess my time constantly occupied passes too rapidly hitherto both emily and i have had good health and therefore we have been able to work well there is one individual of whom i have not yet spoken monsieur heger the husband of madame he is professor of rhetoric a man of power as to mind but very choleric and irritable as to temperament a little black ugly being with a face that varies in expression sometimes he borrows the lineaments of an insane tomcat sometimes those of a delirious hyena occasionally but very seldom he discards these perilous attractions and assumes an air not a hundred times removed from what you would call mild and gentlemanlike he is very angry with me just at present because i have written a translation which he chose to stigmatize as peu correct he did not tell me so but wrote the words on the margin of my book and asked in brief stern phrase how it happened that my compositions were always better than my translations adding that the thing seemed to him inexplicable the reader will already have recognized in the black ugly cleric little professor of rhetoric the one absolutely natural hero of a woman's novel the beloved and whimsical figure of the immortal monsieur paul emmanuel he and emily adds charlotte don't draw well together at all emily works like a horse and she has had great difficulties to contend with far greater than i have had emily did indeed work hard she was there to work and not till she had learned a certain amount would her conscience permit her to return to haworth it was for dear liberty that she worked she began german a favorite study in after years and of some purpose since the style of hoffman left its impression on the author of wuthering heights she worked hard at music and in half a year the stumbling schoolgirl became a brilliant and proficient musician 
Her playing is said to have been singularly accurate, vivid, and full of fire. French, too, both in grammar and in literature, was a constant study. Monsieur Eger recognized the fact that in dealing with the Brontes, he had not to make the customary allowances for a schoolgirl's undeveloped inexperience. These were women of mature and remarkable intelligence. The method he adopted in teaching them was rather that of a university professor than such as usually is used in a pensionnat. He would choose some masterpiece of French style, some passage of eloquence or portraiture, read it to them with a brief lecture on its distinctive qualities, pointing out what was exaggerated, what apt, what false, what subtle in the author's conception or his mode of expressing it. They were then dismissed to make a similar composition without the aid of grammar or dictionary, availing themselves as far as possible of the nuances of style and the peculiarities of method of the writer chosen as the model of the hour. In this way the girls became intimately acquainted with the literary technique of the best French masters. To Charlotte the lessons were of incalculable value, perfecting in her that clear and accurate style which makes her best work never wearisome, never old-fashioned. But the very thought of imitating any one, especially of imitating any French writer, was repulsive to Emily, rustic all through, moorish, wild, and knotty as a root of heath. When M. Heger had explained his plan to them, Emily spoke first, and said that she saw no good to be derived from it, and that by adopting it they would lose all originality of thought and expression. She would have entered into an argument on the subject, but for this M. Heger had no time. Charlotte then spoke. She also doubted the success of the plan, but she would follow out M. Heger's advice, because she was bound to obey him while she was his pupil. Charlotte soon found a keen enjoyment in this species of literary composition, yet Emily's devoir was the best. They are, alas, no longer to be seen, no longer in the keeping of so courteous and proud a guardian as Mrs. Gaskell had to deal with, but she and Monsieur Heger both have expressed their opinions that in genius, imagination, power, and force of language, Emily was the superior of the two sisters. So great was the personality of this energetic, silent, brooding, ill-dressed young Englishwoman that all who knew her recognized in her the genius they were slow to perceive in her more sociable and vehement sister. Madame Heger, the worldly, cold-mannered, surveillante of Villette, avowed the singular force of a nature most antipathetic to her own. Yet Emily had no companions, the only person of whom we hear in even the most negative terms of friendliness is one of the teachers a certain Mademoiselle Marie, talented and original but of repulsive and arbitrary manners, which have made the whole school, except Emily and myself, her bitter enemies. No less arbitrary and repulsive seemed poor Emily herself, a sprig of purple heath at discord with those bright smooth geraniums and lobelias emily of whom every surviving friend extols the never-failing quiet unselfishness the genial spirit ready to help the timid but faithful affection she was so completely hors de son assiette that even her virtues were misplaced there was always one thing she could do one thing as natural as breath to emily determined labor. In that merciful engrossment she could forget her heart-sick weariness and the jarring strangeness of things. Every lesson conquered was another step taken on the long road home, and the days allowed ample space for work, although it was supported upon a somewhat slender diet. Counting borders and externs, Madame Eger's school numbered over a hundred pupils. These were divided into three classes, the second, in which the Brontes were, containing sixty students. In the last row, side by side, absorbed in quiet, sat Emily and Charlotte. Soon after rising, the pensionnaires were given their light Belgian breakfast of coffee and rolls. Then, from nine to twelve, they studied. Three mistresses and seven professors were engaged to take the different classes. At twelve, a lunch of bread and fruit. 
then a turn in the green alley, Charlotte and Emily always walking together. From one till two, fancy work. From two till four, lessons again, then dinner, the one solid meal of the day. From five till six, the hour was free, Emily's musing hour. From six till seven, the terrible lecture pieuse, hateful to the Brontes' Protestant spirit. At eight, a supper of rolls and water, then prayers and to bed. The room they slept in was a long school dormitory. After all, they could not get the luxury so much desired of a separate room. But their two beds were alone together at the further end, veiled in white curtains, discreet and retired as themselves. Here, after the day's hard work, they slept. In sleep, one is no longer in exile. But often Emily did not sleep. The old, well-known pain, wakefulness, longing was again beginning to relax her very heartstrings. The same suffering and conflict ensued, heightened by the strong recoil of her upright heretic and English spirit from the gentle Jesuitry of the foreign and Romish system. Once more she seemed sinking, but this time she rallied through the mere force of resolution. With inward remorse and shame she looked back on her former failure and resolved to conquer, but the victory cost her dear. She was never happy till she carried her hard-won knowledge back to the remote English village, the old parsonage house, and desolate Yorkshire hills. But not yet, not yet this happiness. The opportunity that had been so hardly won must not be thrown away before the utmost had been made of it and she was not utterly alone. Charlotte was there. The success that she had in her work must have helped a little to make her foreign home tolerable to her. Soon she knew enough of music to give lessons to the younger pupils. Then German, costing her and Charlotte an extra ten francs the month, as also much severe study and struggle. Charlotte writes in the summer, Emily is making rapid progress in French, German, music, and drawing. Monsieur and Madame Eger begin to recognize the valuable parts of her character under her singularities. It was doubtful even whether they would come home in September. Madame Heger made a proposal to her two English pupils for them to stay on without paying but without salary for half a year. She would dismiss her English teacher whose place Charlotte would take. Emily was to teach music to the younger pupils, the proposal was kind and would be of advantage to the sisters. Charlotte declared herself inclined to accept it. I have been happy in Brussels, she averred, and Emily, though she indeed was not happy, acknowledged the benefit to be derived from a longer term of study. Six months, after all, was rather short to gain a thorough knowledge of French with Italian and German. When you add to these acquirements music and drawing, which Emily worked at with a will. Besides, she could not fail again, could not go back to Haworth, leaving Charlotte behind. Neither could she spoil Charlotte's future by persuading her to reject Madame Heger's terms. So both sisters agreed to stay in Brussels. They were not utterly friendless there. Two Miss Taylors, schoolfellows and dear friends of Charlotte's, were at school at the Chateau de Cochleberg, just outside the barriers. Readers of Shirley know them as Rose and Jesse York. The Brontes met them often nearly every week at some cousins of the tailors who lived in the town. But this diversion, pleasant to Charlotte, was merely an added annoyance to Emily. She would sit stiff and silent, unable to say a word, longing to be somewhere at her ease. Mrs. Jenkins, too, had begun with asking them to spend their Sundays with her, but Emily never said a word, and Charlotte, though sometimes she got excited and spoke well and vehemently, never ventured on an opinion until she had gradually wheeled round in her chair with her back to the person she addressed. They were so shy, so rustic, Mrs. Jenkins gave over inviting them, feeling that they did not like to refuse and found it no pleasure to come. Charlotte, indeed, still had the Taylors, their cousins, and the family of a doctor living in the town whose daughter was a pupil and friend of hers. Charlotte, too, had Madame Heger and her admired professor of rhetoric, but Emily had no friend except her sister. 
nevertheless it was settled they would stay the grande vacances began on the fifteenth of august and as the journey to yorkshire cost so much and as they were anxious to work the bronte girls spent their holidays in rue d'isabelle besides themselves only six or eight boarders remained all their friends were away holiday-making but they worked hard preparing their lessons for the masters who holidayless as they had stayed behind in white dusty blazing airless brussels to give lectures to the scanty class at madame heger's pensionnat so the dreary six weeks passed away in october the term began again the pupils came back new pupils were admitted m heger was more gesticulatory vehement commanding than usual and madame in her quiet way was no less occupied life and youth filled the empty rooms the bronte girls sad enough indeed for their friend martha taylor had died suddenly at the chateau de coquelebergue were notwithstanding able to feel themselves in a more natural position for women of their age charlotte henceforth by m heger's orders mademoiselle charlotte was the new english teacher emily the assistant music mistress but in the middle of october in the first flush of their employment came a sudden recall to haworth miss branwell was very ill immediately the two girls who owed so much to her who but for her bounty could never have been so far away in time of need decided to go home they broke their determination to monsieur and madame heger who sufficiently generous to place the girl's duty before their own convenience upheld them in their course they hastily packed up their things took places via antwerp to london and prepared to start at the last moment the trunks packed in the early morning the postman came he brought another letter from haworth their aunt was dead so much the greater need that they should hasten home their father left without his companion of twenty years to keep his house to read to him at night to discuss with him on equal terms their father would be lonely and distressed henceforth one of his daughters must stay with him anne was in an excellent situation must they ask her to give it up and what now of the school the school at burlington there was much to take counsel over and consider they must hurry home so knowing the worst their future hanging out of shape and loose before their eyes they set out on their dreary journey knowing not whether or when they might return End of chapter seven chapter eight of emily bronte by agnes mary francis robinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami a retrospect poor brilliant gay moody moping wildly excitable miserable bronte no history records your many struggles after the good your wit brilliance attractiveness eagerness for excitement all the qualities which made you such good company and dragged you down to an untimely grave thus ejaculates mr francis h grundy remembering the boon companion of his early years the half insane pitiful creature that opium and brandy had made of clever branwell at twenty-two returned from bradford his nervous system racked by opium fumes he had loitered about at haworth until his father stubborn as he was perceived the obvious fact that every idle day led his only son more hopelessly down to the pit of ruin at last he exerted his influence to find some work for branwell and obtained for his reckless fanciful morbid lad the post of station-master at a small roadside place ludden and foot by name on the lancashire and yorkshire railway thither he went some months before charlotte and emily left for brussels it was there mr grundy met him a novel station-master had a position been chosen for this strange creature for the express purpose of driving him several steps to the bad this must have been it the line was only just opened 
the station was a rude wooden hut and there was no village near at hand alone in the wilds of yorkshire with few books little to do no prospects and wretched pay with no society congenial to his better taste but plenty of wild rollicking hard-headed half-educated manufacturers who would welcome him to their houses and drink with him as often as he chose to come what was this morbid man who couldn't bear to be alone to do footnote pictures of the past f h grundy End footnote. what branwell always did in fine was that which was easiest to him to do he drank himself violent when he did not drink himself maudlin he left the porter at the station to keep the books and would go off for days on the drink with his friends and fellow carousers about this time mr grundy then an engineer at halifax fell in with the poor half demented lonely creature and for a while things went a little better drink and riot had not embellished the tawny-maned laughing handsome darling of haworth here is his portrait as at this time he appeared to his friend he was insignificantly small one of his life's trials he had a mass of red hair which he wore brushed high off his forehead to help his height i fancy a great bumpy intellectual forehead nearly half the size of the whole facial contour small ferrety eyes deep sunk and still further hidden by the never removed spectacles prominent nose but weak lower features he had a downcast look which never varied save for a rapid momentary glance at long intervals small and thin of person he was the reverse of attractive at first sight yet this insignificant sunken-eyed slip of humanity had a spell for those who heard him speak there was no subject moral intellectual or philosophic too remote or too profound for him to measure it at a moment's notice with the ever-ready fallacious plumb-line of his brilliant vanity he would talk for hours be eloquent convincing almost noble and afterwards accompany his audience to the nearest public house at times we would drive over in a gig to haworth twelve miles and visit his people he was there at his best and would be eloquent and amusing although sometimes he would burst into tears when returning and swear that he meant to amend i believe however that he was half mad and could not control himself so must his friends and kindness think mad if haunting morbid dreads and fancies conjured up by poisonous drugs and never to be laid if a will laid prostrate under the yoke of unclean habits if a constitution prone to nervous derangement and blighted by early excess if such things forcing him by imperceptible daily pressure to choose the things he loathed to be the thing he feared to act a part abhorrent to his soul if such estranging and falsification of a man's true self may count as lunacy the luckless worthless boy was mad it must have galled him going home to be welcomed so kindly hoped so much from by those who had forgiven amply and did not dream how heavy a mortgage had since been laid upon their pardon to have talked to the prim pretty old lady who denied herself every day to save an inheritance for him to watch pious gentle anne into whose dreams the sins she prayed against had never entered worst of all the sight of his respectable well-preserved father honoured by all the parish successful placed by his own stern continued will high beyond the onslaughts of temptation yet with a temperament singularly akin to that morbid passionate son's so he would weep going home weep for his falling off and perhaps more sincerely for the short life of his contrition then the long evenings alone with his thoughts in that lonely place would make him afraid of repentance afraid of god himself night all he would drink he had fits of as contrary pride he was proud of his name his strength and his abilities proud of his name he wrote a poem on it bronte an eulogy of nelson 
which won the patronizing approbation of Lee Hunt, Miss Martineau, and others to whom, at his special request, it was submitted. Had he ever heard of his dozen aunts and uncles, the Pruntys of Ahaderg, or if not, with what sensations must the vicar of Haworth have listened to this blazoning forth and triumphing over the glories of his ancient name? Branwell had fits of passion, too, the repetition of his father's vagaries. I have seen him drive his doubled fist through the panels of a door. It seemed to soothe him. The rough side of his nature got full play, and perhaps won him some respect denied to his cleverness in the society amongst which he was chiefly thrown. For a little time the companionship of Mr. Grundy served to rescue him from utter abandonment to license, but in the midst of this improvement the crash came. As he had sown, he reaped. Those long absences, drinking at the houses of his friends, had been turned to account by the one other inhabitant of the station at Ludendenfoot. The luggage porter was left to keep the books, and following his master's example, he sought his own enjoyment before his employer's gain. He must have made a pretty penny out of those escapades of Branwell's for some months after the vicar of Haworth had obtained his son's appointment, when the books received their customary examination. Serious defalcations were discovered. An inquiry was instituted which brought to light Branwell's peculiar method of managing the station. The lad himself was not suspected of actual theft, but so continued, so glaring had been his negligence, so hopeless the cause, that he was summarily dismissed the company's service and sent home in dire disgrace to Haworth. He came home not only in disgrace, but ill. Never strong, his constitution was deranged and broken by his excesses. Yet strangely enough, consumption which carried off so prematurely the more highly gifted, the more strongly principled daughters of the house, consumption which might have been originally produced by the vicious life this youth had led, laid no claim upon him. His mother's character and her disease descended to her daughters only. Branwell inherited his father's violent temper, strong passions, and nervous weakness without the strength of will and moral fiber that made his father remarkable. Probably this brilliant, weak, shallow, selfish lad reproduced accurately enough the characteristics of some former Prunty, for Patrick Branwell was as distinctly an Irishman as if his childhood had been spent in his grandfather's cabin at Ahadurg. He came home to find his sisters all away, Anne in her situation as governess, Emily and Charlotte in Rue d'Isabelle. No one, therefore, to be a check upon his habits, save the neat old lady growing weaker day by day, who spent nearly all her time in her bedroom to avoid the paven floors of the basement, and the father, who did not care for company, took his meals alone for fear of indigestion, and found it necessary to spend the succeeding time in perfect quiet. The greater part of the day was therefore at Branwell's uncontrolled, unsupervised disposal. To do him justice, he does seem to have made so much effort after a new place of work as was involved in writing letters to his friend Grundy, and probably to others suing for employment. But his offense had been too glaring to be condoned. Mr. Grundy seems to have advised the hapless young man to take shelter in the church, where the influence of his father and his mother's relatives might help him along. But as Branwell said, he had not a single qualification, save perhaps hypocrisy. Parsons' sons rarely have a great idea of the church. The energy, self-denial, and endurance which a clergyman ought to possess were certainly not in Branwell's line. Besides, how could he take his degree? Montgomery, it seems, recommended him to make trial of literature. All very well, but I have little conceit of myself and great desire for activity. You say that you write with feelings similar to those with which you last left me. Keep them no longer. I trust I am somewhat changed, or I should not be worth a thought, and though nothing could ever give me your buoyant spirits and an outward man corresponding therewith, I may, in dress and appearance, emulate something like ordinary decency. And now, wherever coming years may lead, Greenland snows or sands of Africa, I trust, etc. 
ninth of june eighteen forty two it is doubtful judging from branwell's letters and his verses whether anything much better than his father's cottage in the wood would have resulted from his following the advice of james montgomery fluent ease often on the verge of twaddle from here and there a bright felicitous touch with here and there a smack of the conventional hymn-book and pulpit twang such weak and characterless effusions are all that is left of the passion-ridden pseudo-genius of haworth real genius is perhaps seldom of such showy temperament poor branwell it needed greater strength than his to retrieve that first false step into ruin he cannot help himself and can find no one to help him he appeals again to mr grundy in a letter which must from internal evidence have been written about this time although a different and impossible year is printed at its heading dear sir i cannot avoid the temptation to cheer my spirits by scribbling a few lines to you while i sit here alone all the household being at church the sole occupant of an ancient parsonage among lonely hills which probably will never hear the whistle of an engine till i am in my grave after experiencing since my return home extreme pain and illness with mental depression worse than either i have at length acquired health and strength and soundness of mind far superior i trust to anything shown by that miserable wreck you used to know under my name i can now speak cheerfully and enjoy the company of another without the stimulus of six glasses of whiskey i can write think and act with some apparent approach to resolution and i only want a motive for exertion to be happier than i have been for years but i feel my recovery from almost insanity to be retarded by having nothing to listen to except the wind moaning among the old chimneys and older ash trees nothing to look at except heathery hills walked over when life had all to hope for and nothing to regret with me no one to speak to except crabbed old greeks and romans who have been dust the last five sick thousand years and yet this quiet life from its contrast makes the year past at luddenden foot appear like a nightmare for i would rather give my hand than undergo again the grovelling carelessness the malignant yet cold debauchery the determination to find out how far mind could carry body without both being chucked into hell which too often marked my conduct when there lost as i was to all i really liked and seeking relief in the indulgence of feelings which form the blackest spot in my character yet i have something still left me which may do me service but i ought not to remain too long in solitude for the world soon forgets those who have bidden it good-bye quiet is an excellent cure but no medicine should be continued after a patient's recovery so i am about though ashamed of the business to dun you for answers to blank excuse the trouble i am giving to one on whose kindness i have no claim and for whose services i am offering no return except gratitude and thankfulness which are already due to you give my sincere regards to mr stevenson a word or two to show you have not altogether forgotten me will greatly please yours etc alas no helping hand rescued the sinking wretch from the quicksands of idle sensuality which slowly engulfed him yet at this time there might have been hope had he been kept from evil deliver himself he could not his great desire for activity seems to have had to be in abeyance for some months for on the twenty fifth of october he is still at haworth he then writes to mr grundy again the letter brings us up to the time when in the cheerless morning charlotte and emily set out on their journey homewards it reveals to us how much real undeserved suffering must have been going on side by side with branwell's purposeless miseries in the grey old parsonage at haworth the good methodical old maiden aunt who for twenty years had given the best of her heart to this gay affectionate nephew of hers had come down to the edge of the grave having waited long enough to see the hopeless fallacy of all her dreams for him all her affection branwell who was really tender-hearted must have been sobered then he writes to mr grundy in a sincere and manly strain my dear sir there is no misunderstanding 
I have had a long attendance at the deathbed of the Reverend Mr. Waitman, one of my dearest friends, and now I am attending at the deathbed of my aunt, who has been for twenty years as my mother. I expect her to die in a few hours. As my sisters are far from home, I have had much on my mind, and these things must serve as an apology for what was never intended as neglect of your friendship to us. I have meant not only to have written to you and to the Reverend James Martineau, gratefully and sincerely acknowledging the receipt of his most kindly and truthful criticism, at least in advice, though too generous far in praise, but one sad ceremony must I fear be gone through first. Give my most sincere respects to Mr. Stevenson and excuse this scrawl. My eyes are too dim with sorrow to see well. Believe me, you're not very happy, but obliged friend and servant, P.B. Bronte. But not till three days later the end came. By that time Anne was home to tend the woman who had taken her, a little child, into her love and always kept her there. Anne had ever lived gladly with Miss Branwell. Her more dejected spirit did not resent the occasional oppressions, the little tyrannies which revolted Charlotte and silenced Emily, and at the last all the constant self-sacrifice of those twenty years spent for their sake in a strange and hated country would shine out, and yet more endear the sufferer to those who had to lose her. On the twenty-ninth of October Branwell again writes to his friend, My dear sir, as I don't want to lose a real friend, I write in deprecation of the tone of your letter. Death only has made me neglectful of your kindness, and I have lately had so much experience with him that your sister would not now blame me for indulging in gloomy visions, either of this world or of another. I am incoherent, I fear, but I have been waking two nights witnessing such agonizing suffering as I would not wish my worst enemy to endure, and I have now lost the pride and director of all the happy days connected with my childhood. I have suffered such sorrow since I last saw you at Haworth that I do not now care if I were fighting in India or blank, since when the mind is depressed, danger is the most effectual cure. Miss Branwell was dead. All was over. She was buried on a Tuesday morning before Charlotte and Emily, having traveled night and day, got home. They found Mr. Bronte and Anne sitting together, quietly mourning the customary presence to be known no more. Branwell was not there. It was the first time he would see his sisters since his great disgrace. He could not wait at home to welcome them. Miss Branwell's will had to be made known. The little property that she had saved out of her frugal income was all left to her three nieces. Branwell had been her darling, the only son called by her name, but his disgrace had wounded her too deeply. He was not even mentioned in her will. End of chapter 8「The Recall » Suddenly recalled from what had seemed the line of duty, with all their future prospects broken, the three sisters found themselves again at Haworth together. There could be no question now of their keeping school at Burlington, if at all, it must be at Haworth, where their father could live with them. Miss Branwell's legacies would amply provide for the necessary alterations in the house. The question before them was whether they should immediately begin these alterations, or first of all secure a higher education to themselves. At all events, one must stay at home to keep house for Mr. Bronte. Emily quickly volunteered to be the one. Her offer was welcome to all. She was the most experienced housekeeper. Anne had a comfortable situation, which she might resume at the end of the Christmas holidays, and Charlotte was anxious to get back to Brussels. It would certainly be of advantage to their school, that cherished dream now so likely to come true, 
that the girl should be able to teach German, and that one of them at least should speak French with fluency and well. M. Eger wrote to Mr. Bronte, when Charlotte and Emily left, pointing out how much more stable and enduring their advantages would become could they continue for another year at Brussels. In a year, he says, each of your daughters would be completely provided against the future. Each of them was acquiring at the same time instruction and the science to instruct. Mademoiselle Emily has been learning the piano, receiving lessons from the best master that we have in Brussels, and already she had little pupils of her own. She was therefore losing at the same time a remainder of ignorance, and one more embarrassing still, of timidity. Mademoiselle Charlotte was beginning to give lessons in French, and was acquiring that assurance and aplomb so necessary to a teacher. One year more at the most, and the work had been completed, and completed well. Emily, as we know, refused the lure. Once at Haworth, she was not to be induced by offer of any advantages to quit her native heath. On the other hand, Charlotte desired nothing better. Hers was a nature very capable of affection, of gratitude, of sentiment. It would have been a sore wrench to her to break so suddenly with her busy, quiet life in the old mansion, Rue d'Isabelle. Almost imperceptibly, she had become fast friends with the place. Mary Taylor had left, it is true, and bright, engaging Martha slept there, too sound to hear her in the Protestant cemetery but in foreign, heretic, distant Brussels there were calling memories for the downright, plain little Yorkshire woman. She could not choose but hear, the black avised, tender-hearted, fiery professor for whom she felt the reverent, eager friendship that intellectual girls often give to a man much older than they, the doctor's family, even Madame Beck, even the Belgian schoolgirls. She should like to see them all again, she did not perhaps realize how different a place Brussels would seem without her sister, and it would certainly be an advantage for the school that she should know German. For these and many reasons, Charlotte decided to renounce a salary of fifty pounds a year offered her in England, and to accept that of sixteen pounds, which she would earn in Brussels. Thus it was determined that at the end of the Christmas holidays the three sisters were again to be divided but first they were nearly three months together. Branwell was at home. Even yet at Haworth that was a pleasure and not a burden. His sisters never saw him at his worst. His vehement repentance brought conviction to their hearts. They still hoped for his future, still said to each other that men were different from women, and that such strong passions betokened a nature which, if once directed right, would be passionately right. They did not feel the miserable flabbiness of his moral fibre, did not know that the weak slip down when they try to stand and cannot march erect. They were both too tender and too harsh with their brother, because they could not recognize what a mere poor creature was this erring genius of theirs. Thus, when the first shock was over, the reunited family was most contented. Lightly, naturally, as an autumn leaf, the old aunt had fallen out of the household, her long duties over, and they, though they loved and mourned her, they were freer for her departure. There was no restraint now on their actions, their opinions, they were mistresses in their own home. It was a happy Christmas, though not free from burden. The sisters parted for so long had much experience to exchange, many plans to make. They had to revisit their old haunts on the moors, white now with snow. There were walks to the library at Keithley for such books as had been added during their absence. Ellen came to Haworth. Then, at the end of January, 1843, Anne went back to her duties, and Charlotte set off alone for Brussels. Emily was left behind with Branwell, but not for long. It must have been about this time that the ill-fated young man obtained a place as tutor in the house where Anne was governess. It appeared a most fortunate connection. The family was well known for its respectable position, came of a stock eminent in good works, 
and the sisters might well believe that under Anne's gentle influence and such favourable auspices their brother would be led into the way of the just. Then Emily was alone in the grey house, save for her secluded father and old Tabby, now over seventy. She was not unhappy. No life could be freer than her own. It was she that disposed, she too that performed most of the household work. She always got up first in the morning and did the roughest part of the day's labor before frail old Tabby came down, since kindness and thought for others were part of the nature of this unsocial, rugged woman. She did the household ironing and most of the cookery. She made the bread, and her bread was famous in Haworth for its lightness and excellence. As she kneaded the dough, she would glance now and then at an open book propped up before her. It was her German lesson but not always did she study out of books. Those who worked with her in the kitchen, young girls called in to help in stress of business, remember how she would keep a scrap of paper, a pencil at her side, and how, when the moment came that she could pause in her cooking or her ironing, she would jot down some impatient thought and then resume her work. With these girls she was always friendly and hearty, pleasant, sometimes quite jovial, like a boy so genial and kind, a little masculine, say my informants, but of strangers she was exceedingly timid, and if the butcher's boy or the baker's man came to the kitchen door she'd be off like a bird into the hall or the parlor till she heard their hobnails clumping down the path. No easy getting sight of that rare bird. Therefore it may be that Howarth people thought more of her powers than of those of Anne or Charlotte, who might be seen at school any Sunday. They say, Adila faucht out or the cleverest of them, e as ever she were so timid, she couldn't frame to let it out. For amusements, she had her pets and the garden. She always fed the animals herself, the old cat Flossie, Anne's favorite spaniel keeper, the fierce bulldog, her own constant dear companion, whose portrait, drawn by her spirited hand, is still extant and the creatures on the moor were all in a sense her pets and familiar with her. The intense devotion of this silent woman to all manner of dumb creatures has something pathetic, inexplicable, almost deranged. She never showed regard to any human creature. All her love was reserved for animals, said some shallow jumper at conclusions to Mrs. Gaskell regard and help and staunch friendliness to all in need was ever characteristic of emily bronte yet between her nature and that of the fierce loving faithful keeper that of the wild moorfowl of robins that die in confinement of quick-running hares of cloud-sweeping tempest boding sea-mews there was a natural likeness the silent growing flowers were also her friends the little garden open to all the winds that course over Lees Moor and Stillingworth Moor to the blowy summit of Haworth Street, that little garden whose only bulwark against the storm was the gravestones outside the railing, the stunted thorns and currant bushes within, was nevertheless the home of many sweet and hardy flowers creeping up under the house and close to the shelter of the bushes. So the days went swiftly enough in tending her house, her garden, her dumb creatures. In the evenings she would sit on the hearth rug in the lonely parlor, one arm thrown around Keeper's tawny neck, studying a book. For it was necessary to study. After the next Christmas holidays, the sisters hoped to reduce to practice their long-cherished vision of keeping school together. Letters from Brussels showed Emily that Charlotte was troubled, excited, full of vague disquiet. She would be glad then to be home, to use the instrument it had cost so much pains to perfect, a costly instrument indeed, wrought with love, anguish, lonely fears, vanquished passion. But in that time no one guessed that not the school teacher's German, not the fluent French acquired abroad, was the real result of this terrible firing, but a novel to be called Villette. Emily then, mean bonny love, as Charlotte used to call her, cannot have been quite certain of this dear sister's happiness, 
and as time went on anne's letters too began to give disquieting tidings not that her health was breaking down it was as usual branwell whose conduct distressed his sisters he had altered so strangely one day in the wildest spirits the next moping in despair giving himself mysterious airs of importance expressing himself more than satisfied with his situation smiling oddly then perhaps the next moment all remorse and gloom anne could not understand what ailed him but feared some evil at home moreover trouble slowly increased old tabby grew very ill and could do no work the girl hannah left emily had all the business of investing the little property belonging to the three sisters since miss branwell's death worse still old mr bronte's health began to flag his sight to fail worst of all in that darkness despair loneliness the old man so emily feared acquired the habit of drinking though not to excess yet more than his abstemious past allowed doubtless she exaggerated her fears with branwell always present in her thoughts but emily grew afraid alone at haworth responsible knowing herself deficient in that controlling influence so characteristic of her elder sister her burden of doubt was more than she could bear she decided to write to charlotte on the second of january eighteen forty four charlotte arrived at haworth on the twenty-third of the month she wrote to her friend every one asks me what i am going to do now that i am returned home and every one seems to expect that i should immediately commence a school in truth it is what i should wish to do i desire it above all things i have sufficient money for the undertaking and i hope now sufficient qualifications to give me a fair chance of success yet i cannot yet permit myself to enter upon life to touch the object which seems now within my reach and which i have been so long straining to attain you will ask me why it is on papa's account he is now as you know getting old and it grieves me to tell you that he is losing his sight i have felt for some months that i ought not to be away from him and i feel now that it would be too selfish to leave him at least as long as branwell and anne are absent in order to pursue selfish interests of my own with the help of god i will try to deny myself in this matter and to wait i suffered much before i left brussels i think however long i live i shall not forget what the parting with m heger cost me it grieved me so much to grieve him who has been so true kind disinterested a friend haworth seems such a lonely quiet spot buried away from the world i no longer regard myself as young indeed i shall soon be twenty-eight and it seems as if i ought to be working and braving the rough realities of the world as other people do wait eager charlotte there are in store for you enough and to spare of rude realities enough of working and braving in this secluded haworth no need to go forth in quest of dangers and trials the air is growing thick with gloom round your mountain eyrie high as it is quiet lonely the storms of heaven and the storms of earth have found it out to break there End of chapter nine